back, everybody, to another episode of the HR revolution or evolution, no matter what way you look at it. HR is evolving, and so is business. Uh, Chris and myself, as, uh, as well as others, love to have conversations to really talk about the future of work. What is the future of HR, and what does it really mean to be that true business partner within the organization today? And we do that with conversations like, like today with Olga. Um, but uh, without further ado, I wanted to introduce my co-host, Chris Derome. Thank you, Kevin. And it's great to be back for another episode of the HR Revolution or Evolution. And, and again, just to reiterate, passion project for Kevin and myself, you know, for all of our listeners or viewers, depending on how you access the podcast or the conversations, really looking to talk about relevant topics, you know, so that we can all use this information and all learn from our, you know, very special expert guests that we have. And today's guest is no exception. It's Olga Mendez. She's currently the Corporate Director of Human Resources with American Packaging Corporation. Olga is an ambitious HR leader. She creates strategic alliances with her leaders throughout the organization in order to support and develop their teams, improve business results, and drive overall performance. Olga has previously worked in healthcare, telecommunications, and manufacturing. Olga, please uh, let me know if I got that wrong or I missed anything. So on behalf of Kevin and myself, we want to thank you, Olga, for taking time to talk with us today and welcome you to the show. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, that was a mouthful, Chris. She obviously <laughs> comes with a lot of different experiences. So I'm really, really excited for this conversation today. And Olga, since you're in Rochester, just like me, and we got to tell Chris a little something up in Buffalo, where are you taking us out for your favorite meal in Rochester? Ooh. Oh, wow, there's so many options here. Um, I think black and blue would be one of the okay. my favorites. Okay, I love it. And what what do you what's your favorite item there at black and blue? What do you usually go to? Well, it's definitely the filet mignon. Okay, yeah. Yeah. It's the go to. <laughs> All right, you passed oh, yeah. the first question, Olga. You didn't say Nick Tahoe, so we're good. We're good. <laughs> Excellent. How about how about music, Olga? You're getting ready, you know, maybe for your your day to go to work, or maybe you're getting ready to do something on the weekend. You pop on some music. What are you listening to? What gets you jazzed and excited? Well, I love Latin music. Okay. I am from. I was born in Puerto Rico, so I love the um, different styles of uh, Latin music, and so I tend to uh, listen to a lot of that on the weekends but also listen to it on my way to work just to get me going and excited about my day. That's fantastic. And it is Hispanic Heritage Month. So hopefully everybody is taking some time to listen to some you know, Latin music as well, too. So that's fantastic. Thank you. I know if I'm looking for a little more energy in my day, that is the exact channel that I go to on <laughs> XM Radio. It always Perfect. just has that way of uh, really getting your mood up. So I feel you there, Olga. So I wanted to, to maybe kind of piggyback off of your heritage. You know, we're, we're having more and more conversations and seeing more employers see the importance or really call from their employees to, to really have more diverse, equitable, and inclusive practices, um, as well as processes. Um, and what have you experienced? Because we've really seen kind of this warp speed, um, this evolution of DE&I at the same time we're seeing the evolution of HR it is evolving. It has evolved quite quickly. What have you experienced so far in the space? Yeah, thank you for that question. Obviously, it is an evolution and it depends on every workforce. My experiences over the 20 plus years that I've been doing HR is just really assessing your uh, workplace. Um, and the reason I say that is because as an HR professional, you need to evaluate and make sure that the business is ready for that, those conversations. Doesn't mean you avoid them, but you strategically approach them in the right moment and the right fashion. Um, one of the things that I really focus on is I have um, a team of HR managers that I work daily with and is challenging them to, as they're hiring for talent to take into consideration their diversity landscape for their respected um, plants that they support. And I think it's important to consistently have the conversation. I also have that conversation when I present to the senior leadership team to take a look at our diversity landscape and um, really showcase where the opportunities are and what are some of the things that we can do to really focus around it. So it's, uh, it's having that open dialogue is, is mm -hmm. very important. Mm -hmm. 
That's great. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. I really appreciate that. Uh, along those lines, as we look at your D, E, and I, and even, you know, I'll add the B on there for belonging as we're trying to create a more inclusive and belonging uh, organization. Tell us a little bit about, you know, the workforce itself. You know, so you, you're in a manufacturing plant, um, probably a lot of representation. What are you doing in, in terms of listening to, you know, your, your employees and really understanding where they're at? Is there anything specific you can call out that would, you know, help other people listening? Uh, to the podcast to understand, you know, how do we really get in tune with our with our workforce? Yeah, I um, appreciate that question. I would say that one of the things that I purposely intentionally do is I put time on my calendar to walk the plant. Okay. And the reason I put it strategically on my calendar is because in HR roles, we certainly get occupied with many deliverables, right? Mm -hmm. But taking the time to really have a pulse on the employees is very important to me and it's something I take pride in. So by doing that, I can go out to the plant, talk to employees. You know, it's always interesting when I get the response of, hey, I haven't seen you in a while, were you on vacation? So that just allows me to really connect with people. Um, yes, they see my communication that I send out periodically, but it's different when they see me and can yeah. purposely engage in dialogue with me. And it's That's immediate great. feedback. That. And and what I love most of about what you said, Ola, is like your calendar can get bombarded with with appointments. But just like we're we're learning with time management skills and everybody's trying to get better with their time management because they've put such a more value on that time. Yeah. Um, I love your 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 tactic of actually blocking blocking it out on the calendar um, because that's how much value and emphasis that you put put on that. Absolutely. Can you go through anything that you've learned through those walkthroughs that have helped factor into kind of decision making or information that you're sharing up the chain? Yeah, um, I think in that process, employees get very comfortable and really engage and there's nothing off the table. So they're very um to ask any general question or make recommendations to the business. I'll give you an example of that because I experienced it very recently where I had an employee actually reach out to me and say, hey, do you know that next week is manufacturing week? And um, I just want to put it out there as the forefront. He wasn't asking for anything. He was just calling it out. Yeah. And so I took that information and I went to my leader and I said, because I've been in this position 16 months, and I said to my leader, do we as a company do anything here to address that? And that led to more conversations. And so now we have a plan in place and I can go back to that employee and say, thank you for reaching out and asking and putting that on the table. And here's what we're gonna do as an action item because you asked the question. And I think that's how you develop that relationship building and also helps our attrition, right? Our retention strategy, because that employee is gonna come back and say, I was just mentioning it, but there's action behind it. And it just shows that we genuinely care for employees. And that's extremely important to me. Well, I think you touched on it because th there's organizations that will survey, right? And they will survey and they will survey. And then employees really see no action, right? And I oh, think wow. you tying that back to, hey, since you spoke up, now you're creating that safe space where people are going to be more open to sharing once they've heard but you've also recognized them at that point. And that type of recognition, in my opinion, is free in most cases, but it's more rewarding to the individual than probably a 2% raise in most cases. Has that been your experience? Absolutely. And you, we, it's no different than when we as a customer have great service, right? We promote it, we talk about it, you know, we put it on social media. It's the same thing it is with our work environment. When our employees have positive experiences, they promote us as an organization. So when we as uh, HR professionals are looking at how do we engage people? How do we retain talent? These are really simple things that we can do to really spread that. I agree. Yeah, I, think, I think Kevin likes to use a, a phrase or a number. There's seven you know, touch points that the, the average employee has with HR or with their HR business partner throughout the course of the year. And, you know, for our job in HR is how do we maximize those touch points? How do we create truly memorable, you know, experiences for those employees along the way? And that's just a great example of it, I think, where, 
you know, you're creating these positive interactions that go a long way. So that's fantastic to hear. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about development, Olga, because I know that that's near and dear to your heart and, you know, helping the, the workforce to learn, grow and development. So tell, take us a, a kind of, you know, behind the scenes a little bit, if you can, to tell us a little bit about some of the perhaps development initiatives that you have in place, whether it's coaching or mentoring um, that might be helpful for our, our audience to hear about. Sure. So in manufacturing, what is a very common practice is uh, part of our succession planning. We use what is called the nine box tool. Mm -hmm. And so I had an opportunity in this role to implement that in our business. They've used it, different models of it. And so that is really to identify uh, future leaders in the business and prepare as an organization to backfill positions. And one of the things that I know noted in my last six years in manufacturing is that there is an opportunity to really be prepared for when people are retiring or when people are leaving those positions. And so going through this exercise with our leadership team has been very positive because it allows us to identify who those high potentials are, but also strategize what are we doing to get those individuals ready for those positions. Because often in our businesses, you know, we get so busy that we all of a sudden end up with a vacancy and we're like, oh my God, so what do we do now? Who's going to fill this vacancy? So this allows us just to be, be more proactive and have a backup plan. The other piece that I think is very key and critical is, you know, working with the new generation that's coming into the workforce. It is extremely important for us as seasoned leaders to really help promote and grow those future leaders. Mm -hmm. And one of my, well, some of my experiences um, that I can speak to is being very intentional and purposeful with um, helping this new generation that's coming into the workplace. Yes, they want constant feedback and, you know, they want to be caught in the moment where you're recognizing it. Um, I'm very intentional. I have um, a Gen Z on my team that's been in my team for probably four months, and I'm extremely purposeful in how I approach this individual. And the reason I do that is because I see an investment in a future leader in her. And so I'm getting ready to do a strategy, HR strategy meeting, and I invited her to participate and the excitement around that, the work and the productivity that I'm getting out of her. It's just fascinating. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing once you uh, empower someone and 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 allow them that space and trust them that you can watch them grow. And it's amazing to me, right? Hearing in manufacturing that that you at American Packaging are prioritizing succession planning is amazing because um, yeah. I would say it's in in most of my cases it's it's hard, right? They get caught up in the day, like you said, and in the job and all of a sudden they, they don't realize that Betty or Mark are, are leaving. Right. And all of a sudden that year is now two weeks and it's like, Oh crap. Uh, <laughs> how did you get that buy-in from leadership to yeah. see the value in succession planning? Because I think it, it needs to be intentional. Right. And I think right. you picking those individuals and saying, we see enough in you that we want to invest in your development to get you to where you want to be after we confirm that's what you want. Um, what have you seen? Yeah, um, well, I will start off by saying that my leader is all about the people. Um, so it makes my job so much easier. Yeah, that helps, and doesn't so it? <laughs> it definitely does. Early yeah. on, as I came into this role, there was a lot of healthy conversations with my leader regarding developing people. And the most important asset in this business is our people. Mm -hmm. And so that just made it so much easier for me to get in front of um, him and the leadership team and say, here's some suggestions, here's what I want to implement and here's how we're going to go about it. And I've been very successful in getting the support that I need and I think part of it is the passion and excitement behind it that makes it easy to sell to. Mm -hmm. So far, this is great, Olga. I think there's a lot of great information and insights you're providing with us with. You started to mention that new generation of leaders, right? And if we think about leadership development, you know, traditionally when, you know, we've got everybody in the office and then things have changed and now post-pandemic, we're getting people back, which is great. And manufacturing is coming back. 
Um, what are the key leadership skills you see now that are really essential, not only for the new leaders who are up, you know, rising through the organization, but you know, the, the leaders that kind of have weathered the storm, so to speak, along the way, you know, what, what, is, what are the key leadership traits or characteristics that you see as most essential? I think being an authentic leader is definitely important. Just being transparent um, with the people that you support and having that connection. Um, I'm very intentional in making sure that I have one-on-one -on -one meetings with the people that report into me and those that are dotted lines to me. I'm very intentional with them as well. Um, it's important specifically with this generation not to cancel those meetings. Sometimes yeah. it gets really busy. That is a trigger for this generation. And I have a 27 year old, so I know firsthand what that uh, looks like. And so it's important for leaders to understand this generation, be aware of it. It's just, to me, it's just so fascinating because I learned so much from them. And in return, they tell me they're learning from me. So it's a give and take. Yeah. But I think those skills are, you know, just being there, supportive, um, providing that feedback and just keeping the two-way conversation. I also think that we need to be more, um, when I say an authentic leader, I mean, just being very genuine and um, being able to have that conversation. Um, I'll give you an example. I was working on a couple of items and, you know, gets really hectic and busy. And I was having a conversation. And then after that conversation ended, I paused and I said, you know, I probably could have done a better job in that discussion with this individual. And I picked up the phone and I called this individual and I said, you know what, I, I just don't feel good about it. And it was funny, the response was this action that you just took made my day. Wow. And yeah. so it's so important just to yeah. be aware of what you're doing and what you're delivering each day. And really being in tune, right, as, as you got to reflect and, and really realize the difference in communication. And I think once we realize the difference on how we communicate and our preferences in communication um, can really help because I, I struggle with the digital communication. I, I, I always read into things because it's hard to pick up on tonality, right? Um, and I think that's, that's my generation to a fault, right? And that's always led to communication challenges with my parents, yeah. frankly, um, with text messaging, right? Um, it's just different. Um, but being aware of that and then calling it out and, and talking it through, I think, is really where, where the magic happens. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I think you said earlier, and I love that you keep using the word intentional. Um, I always say intention drives attention. And I love that you keep saying that because we have to be more intentional, I think. Um, but you mentioned the importance of the younger generation and that mentor-mentee relationship that is bi-directional in most cases in order to really keep the institutional, intellectual, and social capital within the organization as some retire out and, and new enter into the organization, how do you make that happen, right? Because it, it is something that's said to be, it need is, needs to be organic on how they make those connections. How do you encourage that uh, as these new uh, individuals come on into the organization? Um, how do you encourage that within their onboarding or within the early stages of their development? Yeah, um, it's a lot of work and uh, it's important work though. I wanna definitely stress that. So one of the things that I do is that as I see those potentials, I know that I'm one person, I can't do it all. So I use other leaders in the business. So for example, I have someone on my team um, that I purposely have had conversations with her to say, hey, I need you to keep your eyes and mentor and help this new person on the team. This is the value I see them bringing to the team. And while I can't do it all, I know that you have great skills that can be transferred. So help mm -hmm. me with that. And so that's just one illustration of, I think sometimes we just get bottlenecked with, we can't do it all and we can't. You know, I've, I've had some very great mentors and leaders that have said to me, be good at one thing and others will notice. And I take that to heart because that's important. And for me is just being authentic and caring about the people and being just totally transparent. 
So utilizing that mechanism of using those individuals around me that can help support and then doing some uh, follow through. So with this individual, I'll follow through and say, how's it going? Is there anything you need from me? And again, it's that feedback. There's such a desire and an interest in getting feedback. And when I say feedback, I don't mean two weeks from now, tell them what they did two weeks ago. Yeah. I mean, instant mm -hmm. feedback is important. Some people challenge me and say, well, this gener new generation coming into the workplace, they only want to hear the, the good things that they're doing. I disagree 100%. I experience this every day. It has to be done with the best integrity, but you also have to build the relationships. And if you build the relationships, people will respect you and will never forget you. And one example of that that I'll use is um, I had an opportunity to meet with the team that um, was under me previous to joining American Packaging Company. I haven't seen this group uh, in 16 months. They reached out to me and they wanted to connect with me. And it was like, I never left that company. Yeah. They were just so glad to see me. How's it going? These are some things I got promoted because you talked to so-and-so and, and it's just great dialogue. And I think that's the advantage that we as HR professionals have that we can influence and we can mentor and develop others. And again, I go back to the intentional. You have to just be very conscious of it and have the desire to do so. And, and really build those relationships. You're talking about partnerships that, and that internal influence and relationship building that is intentional, right? In order to yeah. kind of get the engagement, but also the buy-in and the commitment. Um, because I think that's a lot of, I think a lot of HR practitioners and professionals get, get upset, right? Um, I think they get frustrated, they get burnt out because yeah. they do know some of the challenges and some of the issues that the individuals are dealing with. And they really struggle to put that into business cases as to why the business needs to prioritize that. Mm -hmm. Can you go into kind of how you developed a relationship with the chief operating officer um, and maybe other business leaders within the organization so they start to prioritize these items um, that typically um, aren't easily translated to business priorities in most cases? Hi. I love this question because, of course, I'm very much into storytelling. So when I joined this company, one of the things that my leader asked me to do is to meet with my predecessor and um, have a conversation. And I will be honest with you, I thought it was just an unusual request, yeah. but it triggered me to say, hmm, there must be more to this. So I proceeded on to do that. And it was great, great conversation. I learned a lot. But in that interaction, um, the person said to me, what do you want to know about your team that you're going to support? And I said, nothing. I want to start fresh. Yeah. I want to make my own judgment. I want to make my own assessment. And the response I got, that's great. Is there anything I can help you with? And my answer was, yes. How do I manage my leader? That was okay. my biggest question. And the response that I got was use facts, use data, have supporting data to support your argument or your recommendations and build relationships. And I thought that was like the best advice that I can get from anyone because that helped me in the role that I am today. And so I feel very comfortable and confident to go in and have very candid conversations. And there's times that we'll learn to disagree and that's okay. But mm -hmm. building those relationships and knowing that there's a very safe place where you can have these conversations is extremely important. Mm -hmm. So I never make a recommendation unless I have the data to support it. Um, it may take a little bit longer than my leader desires, but I'm very strategic in saying I'm still working on it. Just keep the communication going because I find that in HR, sometimes if you don't have the answer, then you just hold off. That is a no-no. Mm -hmm. You always need to provide constant updates. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, specifically in my role, I'm working with folks that have a bandwidth of many people that they support. And so they're moving very fast and quickly. And so it's important that I keep um, ongoing conversation to ensure that I'm keeping them up to date. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it's been an easy road. I also think the experience, I have a lot of experience working with 
senior leadership. So it's been um, very helpful. Um, the other example that I would use is know your audience. I think that's extremely important. So I work with a lot of directors that report to my uh, leader. And so I've built some very strong relationships with them. So there's many times when I'll pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm getting ready to send this to the boss. What do you think? Um, and they'll say, do you want to share it with me? And we'll talk about it. And I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm really creating a very strong relationship, but the delivery of it is very strong because I've already had other folks look at it and provide me some insight and perspective. So that's been very, very uh, successful for me. I love that because they're co-sponsoring whatever you're supporting up to leadership. Right. So they're, they're a part of and involved and there's a little bit more accountability and ownership. That is, that is fantastic, Olga. Just from a decision-making process too, as you're doing that, you're building up your network within the organization, but you're also creating an inclusive organization as well too, where you're getting that feedback, you're getting different inputs, getting perhaps different opinions, which is fantastic before making that decision. So that's great to hear. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, change management, Olga, and when you're looking at, you know, large change initiatives, you know, I, I, thinking back to my time in manufacturing where things were at very fast pace, but I always felt like in order to get, you know, a, a big initiative past the finish line, it took a lot of time and it took a lot of effort. We used to talk about you can't change a battleship, you know, 180 degrees overnight, it takes time to, to shift it around. So tell us you know, what you've found, what you've experienced when it comes to change management throughout the organization. And um, you know, what have you seen work? And then what are some areas where maybe you know, there are challenges you face that you, know, you, need to, you need to really pay attention in order to get things successfully through? Sure. So I think any organization, regardless it's you know, educational, healthcare, manufacturing, change is very, very difficult for the average individual, right? No matter how good you are at it, because you're changing something that may be very close to them or that they were part of creating. So I think being aware of that in, in itself is very important. Interesting enough, when I joined this company and started to really get to know my team that reports into my organization, I asked the common question, what do you think the biggest challenge for me in this role will be? And every single one of them said, change. This organization really struggles with change. And I listened to that and learned to get in front of it and learn some strategies on overcoming some of that. And it's interesting because as I sit here 16 months, uh, we have gone through so much change in the 16 months that I've been here. And so I sit back and say, yes, it wasn't easy. We've made a lot of changes, but we've been working together as a team. Mm -hmm. And I think the one thing that I will say that has been successful, that I think it's important to note, explain the whys behind the change. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have any hesitation with a production employee coming into my office and saying, I need to understand the whys behind it. My door is always open. I'm always willing and able to have that conversation because I think it's important for them to understand the whys behind it. And then the other layer of that is allowing myself to help the management team understand the whys and helping them to have the same conversations as well. So one of the tools that I use a lot when we do any changes in our businesses you know, I get on calls with the management team and I provide them, you know, questions and answers tools so that they have it handy. Yeah. And then I ask them for feedback. Is there anything I haven't covered? Is there anything you want to add? Is there something that's on your mind that we need to really hone in on? And so again, we're working together towards a better good and that helps us move forward with the changes that we're implementing. Thank you. Everybody loves that teamwork, right? And uh, I, I think I, we continue to see the power of, of really that cross-functional uh, leadership at the end of the day, right? And partnerships, because we continue to see it in a lot of organizations. They're, they're very siloed because of the work that needs to get done in the time that they have it. Um, and building these relationships are, are hard and challenging with managers. Absolutely. Hmm. 
have you found it more successful by asking the, the, the managers the questions on what motivates them, Olga? Like to build that partnership and that trust that you have with them because a lot of HR practitioners, frankly, are missing it. They're, they're on their own island, right? They feel alone. They feel voiceless. Um, but here you are really being a leader first um, and then an HR practitioner and professional um, is what I'm hearing. But how do you build those critical relationships, not only at the executive level, but also kind of those mid-tier, mid-tier management levels as well? Yeah, I think it's all about teaching, teachable moments. So having the opportunity to, you know, have the conversations with the managers to say, you know, are you, do you feel comfortable about this change that we're making? Tell me what are you struggling with? And building those relationships with them allows me and them to ask questions to say, okay, so what if this employee challenges me on this? How do I position that conversation? Mm -hmm. And so we kind of do the role playing and, you know, people use that in general and some people like it and others don't. I'm a strong believer of it because there may be tactics that I have used in the past and experiences that can help them and really shine a light on this is how you position it. And so that's been very beneficial. I think for the HR managers in my circle, I, I'm very st- strategic about teaching that just to say, okay, so if an employee comes to you and challenges us in this change, how are you going to handle it? And I'm doing that because I want, I'm trying to teach them, but I'm also want to see, are they comfortable with how they're going to deliver it? And so that's been very, very beneficial. I love that you said teaching and coaching because yeah. one thing to tell them what they have to do, but right. walking them through that process. So then you can remove yourself from that equation. And cause that's real, that's real development, right? That's real training. Yeah. That's real education and probably has a higher absorption rate than let's face it. Some of the online trainings that we're now getting through LMS systems. Sure. So um, we, we talked a lot about, you know, leadership development. We talked about building relationships. We talked about strategic you know, uh, alignment as well, too. Uh, I want to shift a little bit, you know, and talk a little bit about uh, recognition, rewards, and, and kind of just retention in general. Olga. So, you know, over the past year or so, we've heard phrases like the great resignation or the great reshuffling or the great whatever R word you want to put in there. Uh, what have you seen within not only the organization, but maybe the, you know, the industry as well? Uh, and what are you finding that works well when it comes to retaining your employees, you know, we know that's just, as Kevin mentioned earlier, it's not just a quick 2% raise, you know, we're looking at total rewards, we're looking at, you know, uh, empowering people to bring their total selves to work, any insights you can provide us based on your experience in that, in that arena. Yeah, it's almost like we were all looking for this crystal ball, right, (laughs) to solve for this. And I think that, you know, it's, again, it's just an evolution of what we're seeing throughout our world um, with so many changes and so many factors happening throughout society. I think one thing that is extremely important is, you know, allowing employees to see leadership and hear from leadership. One thing that we recently did in our company that we have not done in my understanding in the last five years plus was have what we call town hall meetings. And so we had the owner we had the president, we had all of senior leadership go out to the different plants that we have throughout American packaging. And it was very intentional. We wanted to get in front of our employees and thank them personally and give them business updates um, and really just share with them, you know, our support and the great things that we appreciate from our employees because it's been some very challenging years. In addition to that, we also went ahead and did some raffles, and um, we basically um, had an opportunity to, prior to the town hall, ask employees what was their favorite, um, you know, community initiative, and if they wanted to donate, what would that organization be? And so we were able to get in front of these folks, our the employee population here, and say these were the organizations that people recommended and we pulled names and again their voices were being heard we're giving back to them and then um i just think it was very positive 
Um, we highlighted again some business stuff that uh, we were doing. And then we gave out some really big prizes. And the message was, you know, we're here to support you. We can't do it alone. And we appreciate you. And we provided a lunch. And then all of leadership sat down with employees to have lunch. We received so many positive accolades because of those gestures. Um, people really appreciated. We asked questions prior to the meeting. So we were very, again, very strategic, very intentional in that yeah. approach. This is just one example. That's, well, that's a great example because I, I think you touched on the, the three keys that we're, we're seeing to attracting or retaining. People just want to feel listened to, valued, and heard. And I think I heard you check every single one of those boxes. And it is a continuous cycle when you have opened up those listening channels like you have with going out on the floor, blocking out that time on your calendar, yeah. uh, scheduling this time to sit down with managers and leaders. I mean, it's the list goes on and on, but it's also how you effectively communicate that message back to the employees too, to tie that bow on it. Because um, a lot of times I think sometimes we take those initiatives, right? We do do the action, but we don't give the rewards and recognition to those that provided those insights. So uh, almost deteriorating that actual trust um, for those great ideas, I think over time. So it's just amazing because I think over 16 months, yes, you've had a lot of change, but it's it's small things, right? And 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 not to discount any of the changes that you have made that I've done not aware of, but these are just little things that listening more, you know, being more intentional, you know, being available, um, like you're saying, but it also comes from your unique awareness, I think, of the multi-generations, Olga. It is your investment in really understanding those differences and making leadership aware of those. Um one of the last questions that I had, at least, was really understanding in your estimation, um, because you've been in HR a long time, um, and you've seen HR evolve and, and, and really change and adapt. Is this the most exciting time that you've had in HR, um, because the businesses are really committed or, or making this an emphasis and a focus? Um, is it an exciting time to be a leader in HR for yourself? I would say 100% yes. And the reason I feel that way is because more and more um, organizations need HR to have a seat at the table. Um, the decisions that are being made, the employees' situations and employee relations, um, you know, cases that we're seeing really call for very thoughtful you know, leadership um, experience and strategies. And I think it's important that organizations really understand the value of um, HR leaders. I know that when I decided to join this company, that was the number one question that I asked during the interview. Tell me why you value HR and why is this position important? Why not just um, eliminate the position? And it was very profound, the answers that I received that sold me that this was the right decision for me. And I have not regretted it, not once. What two great questions for every HR practitioner and professional, if you are interviewing, would be those two questions that Olga just said. Um, I think that would tell a lot because we get asked quite frequently, what happens if I report to finance? What does that tell me? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, sometimes we know what that means, that they prioritize profits over people in some cases. So fascinating. So those two questions, take those away and use those in your next interview and conversation because those those will tell a lot, I think, and really tell them how intentional they are and what their current view is and what that relationship looks like. So, Chris. Yeah, so that's been fantastic. Thank you, Olga. Um, this has been a great conversation. We like to end the conversation with a, a question that we ask all of our guests. So we're going to ask it to you as well. In your estimation, how do you see the future of work continuing to evolve? I mean, we've, we've experienced a lot of change over the last two, two and a half years. How do you see that, you know, continue to, to change? And what, what do you think we can expect over the next, you know, two and a half, three years? I don't have the all-inclusive answer to that question, Chris, but I would just say that we need to understand as leaders that the workforce has changed, right? And that the days of um, the employers had the right hand, an upper hand to hire and 
have a line waiting out at the door, those days are gone, right? We have to really be salespeople in our roles and promote the organization and promote the benefit and the whys behind it and be that employer of choice. And it, again, everything we've discussed today just really starts with understanding your people and being very intentional as a leader in promoting your brand is extremely important. And you need people in your organization that believe in your brand and can sell your brand. I love that. I love that because it's one thing if the business is the only one promoting their brand, but the right. people, the individuals themselves are are probably the, the strongest forms of marketing, recruiting, um, all of that. Um, Olga, I'm glad that you finally accepted my request to be on this show. I hope you had a good time. I hope well, you enjoyed I it. I know this was a fascinating conversation for myself. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for giving us your time and, and saying yes and being on the show and sharing those Great, great tangible takeaways um, for, for today's you. HR professionals or maybe individual, individuals that are looking to make a change in their career. Um, so thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of the show. Of course. Thank you both. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.